morning. Uh, I'm so happy to be here, back here at RubyConf. Um, I'm back here in Nashville. Um, so, okay, let's get right into it. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about some mistakes that I've made in life and in code, and some of the lessons that I am learning from those mistakes. So, a couple of years ago, I lost my dreams, and I lost my faith. Let's talk about dreams. I was one of those people who, from a very young age, had a pretty specific idea of the life that I was supposed to arrive at, the life that was correct for me to have. And so, from the age of about 18 onward, I set myself pretty much single-mindedly to arriving at that life, and I knew that I had a lot to do to get there, and so I set about it kind of like ticking off these check boxes towards this goal. Um, things like getting into the, into the software industry and um, getting married, having, a bunch, having kids, leveling up my career, leveling up my... Um, my reputation with stuff like podcasting and blogging and, and writing books and public speaking uh, in order to level up my career further and then going out into consulting and then running my own business. And all these things checking off boxes towards this goal, this picture that I had in my head of the life that I needed to arrive at. And like I said, I was pretty single-minded um, along the way, things like uh, other things like hobbies um, and friendships kind of fell by the wayside. And at the age of 35, I achieved that goal. I was done. I had a big house um, in the mountains, in the woods. I had a wife and lots of kids. I was working, I was running my own business, working from home. Um, with my family surrounding me, I had exactly the life that I had set out to achieve. And I got to enjoy this state of being um, for about two years. Um, and then a surprise occurred. Uh, my marriage unexpectedly fell apart. And I found myself alone in that big house in the woods, pr reconsidering pretty much everything about the life that I'd lived up to that point. And as I was thinking about this, um, I kind of realized, I don't know if you've seen the Lego movie, but I realized I had become Lord Business, trying to get everything just fixed in place in the perfect ideal position, that happily ever after position, so I could glue it all in place with crazy glue till the end of time. I realized that I had been trying for almost two decades to bring my life to an end. Not an, an end in death, but a static state, fixed. I had been trying to achieve a successful return value. Now, as I was pondering this, I was also in the process of losing my faith. And when I say faith, I, I mean my faith in the dominant religion of our time, object-oriented programming. My entire career has, has circled around object-oriented programming from the very beginning. Along the way, I learned a lot about what it meant to do object-oriented programming. Um, and then along the way, further on, I unlearned most of that. Uh, and, um, but I mean, what, who even gets to define what is true object-oriented programming anyway? Well. This guy is a good, is a good one to, to go to for that. Uh, uh, who knows who this is? All right, so this is Alan Kay. Alan Kay invented object-oriented programming. He came up with the concept. Um, and eventually, I discovered his writings about it, and I discovered that, that he had written um, that to him, OO just meant um, messaging, uh, encapsulation of state process, 
and extreme late binding of all things. And of these three, the most important to him was messaging. And he even said that he regretted calling it object-oriented programming because it put the focus on the wrong piece. So once I, once I understood this about OO, I started trying really hard to just focus on that one piece, messaging, that one um, component, and try to understand all the programming that I did in terms of messaging. And I tried to teach OO in terms of messaging. But along the way, I started to feel more and more cognitive dissonance. So let's, let's think about messaging for a minute here. Um, messaging, this is built on the, the physical metaphor of sending a message in the mail. So let's compare sending a message in the mail to uh, what we call sending a message in any modern object-oriented programming language like Ruby. When we send a message in the mail, we sum up all the information that the recipient needs in order to act on the message, um, and we send that summary to them, and that's all they get. In an OO language, we send a reference to an object, and they can reach back through that reference to get all kinds of extra information. When we send a message in the mail, and the recipient doesn't understand it, or maybe it just doesn't reach them at all, what happens? What, well, as the sender, nothing happens to me. Nothing bad happens to me. But when we do that in an OO language, what happens? We get an exception. Our whole, the sender's whole stack of execution blows up. It's game over for the sender. Most importantly, when we send a real message in the mail, um, we don't have to freeze at the mailbox until the sender is able to act on that message. But that is exactly what happens in any modern OO language. You know, a lot of people will tell you that the original sin of object-oriented programming was mutable state. I disagree. I believe that the original sin of object-oriented programming was return values. Retained from the procedural languages that came before. Return values are a fundamental denial of the messaging model. Um, and when you look at some of the other stuff that Alan Kay wrote, um, you know, he wrote, uh, I thought of objects being like biological cells or individual computers on a network and only able to communicate with messages. And in talking about small talk, which was the language that he and his team built to embody the OO idea, he said they never quite got there. And then future versions, further versions, kind of backslid towards the past. And that, those future versions of small talk are what Ruby and every other modern OO language is based on and inspired by. So here's the big lie of object-oriented programming for the past 40 years. We keep saying we're sending messages. We keep talking as if messaging is the model. But it's not. That's not the actual semantics of what we're doing. It's really, it's really the same call and return semantics of the procedural languages that preceded it. So, I lost my, my dreams, and I was losing my faith in OO, and I, as I reflected on these things, I realized that they had something in common. That there was something at the core that related both of these things. I realized they both stemmed from the same worldview. They both stem from viewing the world in terms of goal-obsessed, uninterrupted, blocking procedures fixated on success, on that successful return value. And another word for this, a shorter word for this, is a transaction. A transaction is something that is synchronous and blocking. It either completes or it self-destructs. It has no visible or intermediate state. It's, it's totally built around a goal. It has no identity of its own. It has no persistent state or history. 
and it's independent, it's self-contained. I have come to call this, I've come to think of this as the transactional fallacy. The transactional fallacy occurs every time we look at something that is a process and we model it as a transaction instead. And this transactional fallacy is endemic in programming. It is everywhere. Every time your program freezes up while it's parsing a particularly big hunk of data and you realize that just to show an updating progress report while it's processing those big hunks would take a significant rewrite, that's the transactional fallacy. When you've got an architecture that's built around a bunch of stateless service objects and you've got a workflow that originally just hits one of those service objects, you know, it's got a request that hits one of those service objects, and then later on, that workflow becomes more complex and it needs to flow through several different requests hitting different service objects, and you find yourself trying to find ways to sneak little bundles of intermediate state from one service object to the next in order to complete that workflow. That's the transactional fallacy. I see this all the time with forms. Forms are a way that we try to force communication into, the, into a transactional model. The communication is not transactional. And so we find ourselves doing things like realizing that, oh, that we need to split a form across multiple pages and that that requires some rewriting. And then we discover that people are mad at us because they fill out part of the form and then they have to go pick up their kids from school and, um, and the form has reset itself in the, in the, in the, in the meantime. And so we start, have to add a bunch of code to um, make it possible for them to save and continue later. And then, then we discover that, oh, we actually need to be able to query data from those incomplete forms. So it's not sufficient to have that data just like squirreled away in, in the, uh, the session or something. And so we have to rewrite a whole bunch more in order to, and change our schema. This is the transactional fallacy. It's the results of modeling a process as if it was a transaction. Whenever I have to take one of my kids to a new doctor, I have to spend 15 minutes filling out in, uh, intake paperwork. Anybody else feel my pain on this? It sucks, right? But at least I know if I put the clipboard down, it won't reset itself. <laughs> at least I know if they call my kid back to the examination room while I'm filling it out, I can take it with me and I can keep filling it out while they're getting checked out. At least I know if I leave some fields blank, they know where to find me, they can call me back. It's not a transaction, it's a process. And I shudder to think what the intake process would look like if it was, if it was architected by a programmer. The transactional fallacy has a symbol, and it's one that you're probably already familiar with, even if you're not, um, if you're, even if you're not aware. That symbol is the spinning beach ball of doom. This is the universal symbol that a programmer thought, a uh, thought something would either finish or fail more or less instantaneously, and it did neither of those things. So what's the alternative? Well, for an alter alternative, we can look again to Alan Kay. He said he thought of objects being like biological cells or individual computers on a network sending messages to each other. Does this sound, um, does this sound like a transactional model? Does this sound like call and return? No, it sounds like something much more asynchronous and independent. And when we look at the history of small talk, um, we can see hints of something very different. Um, this is a snippet of small talk 72 code. Uh, what you're looking at here is a class and that class is also a function. It's a function over a stream of events. Um, and it's pattern matching on those events and deciding what to do with each one. Now, for some of you, this might be ringing a little bit of a bell. Because if you squint, 
it looks kind of like Erlang or Elixir code. The code for an actor pattern matching on events. And this is not a coincidence. Um, there was a lot of cross-pollination cross um, in the history of these two projects, Erlang and, and Smalltalk. And as you may know, if you have messed with Erlang or Elixir, uh, they are built on what? Processes. This is what I've realized. Message-oriented message -oriented programming implies process-oriented. You can't have the one without the other. You have to have something that's more like independent active processes, something like um, actors. When Alan Kay was talking about message-oriented programming, he was implying objects as processes. And so much of what we model in software actually turns out to be a process. It turns out to be a workflow, a purchase order. It's not just a static entity. It gets created, it goes through various states, it gets filled in with line items, it gets sent for review, it gets finalized, maybe eventually gets archived. User accounts are processes. They get introduced maybe in a, a um, partial state and then they get validated and confirmed and then they might get elevated in privileges or they might get locked. They too might be archived at some point. HTTP requests. We try to make them look like transactions, but they're not. T you know, look at, the, look at them under a, look at the actual TCP conversation that's happening there and HTTP requests are processes. So much of what we, we model are actually processes, and then we arbitrarily slice across those processes into objects, into entities. And we wonder why our systems are so hard to understand. What if we stopped focusing on the static structure and we started looking for those processes? We started explicitly modeling these workflows in the human systems that we are trying to facilitate. And this is the space that I've started exploring. Um, and uh, pretty early on in that, I realized that one problem with this is that uh, the word process is um, a little too ambiguous because it's highly overloaded in our space. We use process to mean a lot of things already. And so I've started using the word narrative instead. And for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna say narrative, because I think this captures um, kind of what I'm talking about. The more you look, the more you look at the world from this perspective, the more you realize it's narratives all the way down. It's narratives everywhere. It's not just the, the business models, but the project that you are working on right now is a narrative. Your software team is a narrative. Your own cells are constantly dying and being replaced, and yet you have a coherent identity. It's not so much that you are a person as that you are personing. You are a living narrative. And your life is a narrative. It is not a transaction with a return value. There is no return, which means there is no finish line. There is no success. Success does not make sense in this context. And I have a belief. I believe very strongly that the way we design software is unconsciously influenced by our beliefs about how the world works. And it goes the other way, too. I believe our ways of perceiving the world are unconsciously influenced by how we model the world in code. Because you can't do this stuff eight hours a day or more without it influencing the way you think of the world. So transactional thinking is really a philosophical problem. And it leads to brittle lives and brittle code. And this actually turns out to be a, um, a point of division among actual philosophers. It's a point, it's, a, um, it's something they debate in the field of metaphysics. 
between the schools of substance metaphysics and process metaphysics. Um, Kelsey Vieira has an article in Aeon um, where they say, they kind of break this down, they say, we often see the world as a world of things. Objects are the paradigmatic mode of existence, the basic building blocks of the universe. But process philosophers think we should instead examine the processes that make up the world. Processes, not objects, are fundamental. Process philosophy invites us to look at longer stretches of time, blurred boundaries and connected relations. Identity as a process welcomes innovation through small recurring changes. So this is a philosophical problem. I also happen to believe that programming fundamentally is not about coding. Programming is fundamentally applied philosophy. We use code as a way to reflect our understanding of the world. So we can't partition these parts of our lives. We can't compartmentalize them away from each other. As a result, I think that the best way to start thinking in narratives may be to start with how we approach our lives. And so with that in mind, I want to spend the rest of my time up here talking about what it means to think in terms of narratives. But I want to do that mostly from the point of view of how I am now learning to think about my life and to live my life. And along the way, maybe we'll have some hints about how that might apply to code. So first off, a narrative has a direction, not a goal. As I've started embracing, as I've started moving away from a goal-oriented life, I've found it helpful, instead of having goals, to have um, certain images that I pull towards. And these are images that are they're kind of concrete, but they're also kind of fanciful. My friend Artie Starr refers to these, uh, calls these having an arrow, something that gives you direction. One example of an arrow that I'll give you is my beer list. Now, my beer list is not a list of beers. It is a list of people that I would love to have a beer with someday. Now, you will probably not be surprised at this point to learn that Alan Kay is on that list. Um, but there are others. It would be really cool to have a beer with the poet Ruby Kaur. I think that would be fascinating. I'd love to have a beer with the dancer Marquise Scott someday, otherwise known as nonstop. But here's the thing about the beer list. It's not about, I hope I random, like, run into them in an airport bar someday, or I get a backstage pass. It's not about that. What the beer list means is, what would it mean, what would it take for it to make sense for me to have a beer with one of these people? For one of these people to want to have a beer with me? What is the direction that my life would need to move in? for that to become more likely? What are the circles that I would need to move in? What is the impact that I should be, ha the kind of impact that I should be having on the world and people around me in order to make that kind of thing, that kind of meeting more likely? Who do I need to be, who do I need to be becoming in order for one of these meetings to be more likely? I will probably never have a beer with most of the people on this list but it gives me a direction. It gives me a heuristic when making choices in life. What does it mean, what might it mean for code to have a direction instead of a goal? Well, it could mean embracing the actor model like I was talking about earlier. Or it could mean just acknowledging that all or nothing thinking is not good enough and that we need feedback earlier than all done. And so, structuring our code using streaming or batching models. If you want to learn more about um, 
doing things using the actor model approach. Elixir is a great way of, uh, learning Elixir is a great way to start. It's kind of a mashup of Erlang and Ruby. How many people here are, have studied some Elixir? I'm curious. Nice. Um, so a narrative has a direction. And having a direction implies that a narrative is constantly becoming. And becoming requires being also aware of where you are so that you can see where that direction points. Where you are what, and who you are now. And that means that a narrative must be aware of itself. The best teacher you could possibly have for being aware of yourself is one that's right there with you all the time. It's your body. Your body is never static. It has no ideal end state. Your body is constantly dying and replacing itself. Your body will interrupt you in the middle of, of trying to achieve some return value with little reminders of the process of life, like, I'm sleepy, I'm hungry, I'm cold. You know, I think as programmers, we try really hard to be brains in jars. Uh, we like to pretend that our ideas can be completely separated from our bodies. But learning to embrace narrative as a person means acknowledging that you are an embodied mammal. It means learning to live in your body. This can mean something as simple as embracing some kind of mindfulness practice. It can mean taking up yoga. It can mean running or lifting or biking. Um, all these things can help put you in touch with your body. But as you do any of these activities, be careful. Um, because we hackers are so addicted to being brains in jars that even as we're in the midst of these activities in our bodies, we find ways of taking ourselves out of our bodies and getting back into our analytical brains. We measure and we quantify instead of learning to listen to our bodies. And in case it's not clear what I'm saying, what I'm saying is throw away your Fitbit Learn to feel when it's time to take more steps. Learn to feel your target heart rate. Learn to feel when you're dehydrated. Excuse me. <laughs> what might it mean for code to be self-aware? Well, it could mean building our code, building in observability first instead of treating it like an afterthought. It could mean finding ways to make our algorithms tell the story of their results and the provenance of their data. This could help ad with addressing algorithmic bias as well. If you wanna get started learning more about, um, about building observability in, I highly recommend uh, Charity Major's work. Follow her on Twitter, look at the stuff that she's written. Knowing where you are and where you're going also means that you know where you've been. So embracing narrative means embracing history and state. And I realize that embracing state is not always the most popular suggestion. Um, but state is simply the acknowledgement that everyone, everything we want to accomplish with computers or otherwise involves the passage of time. State is the acknowledgement that any narrative in the world, whether it's a workflow or a human being, is an accumulation of events and their lasting effects. You know, we love the idea of a clean reset, a reboot. It's so simplifying. But that's not what we actually have to work with. Embracing state means embracing history and acknowledging that there are no clean slates. We have to build with the past. It means, embracing, it means embracing that rich legacy project instead of throwing it away and building a new one, no matter how much you might want to. 
It could mean other things, too. It could mean looking into the practice of temporal modeling, which is the, pract which is the practice of modeling your systems no, uh, not in terms of their static entities and structure, but in terms of the events that occur and the commands that humans send to them. Um, this leads naturally into the event sourcing architecture, um, which is another um, great thing to study if you haven't looked into it. Um, model, again, modeling systems in terms of the flow of events through them first. And um, discovering these events, figuring out how your system is structured out of events, uh, can mean looking into event storming, which is a way of getting everyone together and figuring out um, how your system looks from a, from a temporal perspective, from an event-based perspective and discovering those events. If you want to learn more about that last one, event storming, uh, look into Alberto Brandolini's work. Embracing history means embracing entropy. It means embracing surprises and failure. But in narratives, we look for a way to fail forwards because we realize that there will always be surprises. Sometimes a scorpion just falls onto your monitor out of the blue. Totally hypothetical example. <laughs> but think about in, in standard OO languages, like Ruby, what is, this, what is the stereotypical way to handle a surprise of this nature? We raise an exception, right? We blow away the whole process, the whole, the whole stack, blow away all of our local variables, all of our state, probably a bunch of database connections and other connections. In the process, we wipe away, you know, we burn down the whole house. We wipe away any of the, any of the information that might have helped us um, diagnose that problem or maybe even continue forwards from it. You know, something that I've observed over my career is that the more focus we get on preventing failure, the more catastrophic the failure is when it finally breaks through, and it always breaks through. We need to be less focused on preventing failure and how, more on how we adapt and move forwards. Part of, this be, part of this means being okay with being not okay. It means learning to sit and work uh, skillfully with suffering and failure. My friend Amy Newell has been giving some talks, some great talks about the importance of working skillfully with suffering instead of rejecting it. And um, she is giving a talk later at this conference and you should totally go to it. Amy, are you in here? Hi, Amy. Um, you should totally go to her talk. So what, is, what does it mean to fail forwards in code? Well, it could mean choosing in some situations, in some contexts, not to model failure as an exception, not to model surprises as exceptions, but model that as an outcome instead. Collect information about the outcome, errors as data. Could mean embracing um, uh, patterns like sagas. Sagas are, are, a way, are a pattern where instead of trying to prevent failure, we stage some actions that for mitigating the failure should it occur. We get those ready. And then if it does happen, we apply those, those mitigating actions. Um, in general, it means spending less of our time trying to prevent, working to prevent failure, writing code to prevent failure, writing tests and checks to prevent failure, and more of our time thinking about how are we going to do mitigation? How are we going to do remediation when something does go wrong? Mitigation and remediation can be as simple as issuing a heartfelt apology instead of being heads down, so heads down in trying to fix it that you look like you're not even there. The, uh, the resilience engineering movement has started a wonderful conversation about this. And one of the things that they will tell you is that you can't encode resilience into your software. You can only build resistance into the socio-technical system that surrounds your software. And if you want to learn more about resilience engineering, one place to start is with this, the Stella report. 
look that up. Being, learning to be okay in a failed state means embracing interdependence. When my transactional life raised an exception and came crashing down, I realized something. I realized I had a lot of friends online, but I had completely failed to build my local tribe. Locally, I had no one. I did a, a Twitter poll about this a while back, and over a thousand people responded, and the vast majority of them felt that they did not have an adequate local support system. I think this is an epidemic problem among programmers. I think part of being a brain in a jar is that we find it really easy to content ourselves with online relationships. You know, it's not, it's not a big leap from believing we can divorce our ideas from the rest of our bodies to believing that typing text to a friend is just as good as getting a beer together. Um, and it is just as good, until it's not. Until you really, really need to just go out and, and have someone who can actually hold your hand and talk things through with you. Or until you need somebody who can bring a meal over to you when you can't bring yourself to get out of bed. So, if, if you're in that majority, if you feel like you're in that majority that doesn't have an adequate local support network, if you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope you'll take this away. I strongly encourage you, go out and start building those local friendships. And do it now before something catastrophic happens. If you're not sure how to get started, please come talk to me. What does it look like for code to be interdependent? Well, we actually have a lot of, um, we have a lot of patterns for this. Um, patterns like back pressure and cues, or back off algorithms, or the circuit breaker pattern. The thing that all these have in common is that they're all about one component holding state for another component. I mean, they, they're all about components knowing about each other, not being black boxes, but knowing about each other, knowing about each other's health. In other words, these are all rudimentary forms of empathy in code. If you want to learn more about some of these patterns, I recommend um, checking out one of these books, Release It, um, or Reactive Design Patterns. They've got some great stuff. So these are, these are some of the values that I'm learning as I learn to look at life more in terms of narratives. Have a direction. Sense yourself. Embrace state. Fail forwards. And be interdependent. Transactions. They either finish or they fail. And along the way, they deny other possibilities. But narratives go on and on like a graceful dance. They embrace possibility. So I want to encourage you to weave graceful narratives in code and in life. Thank you very much.